in this topic. I would like to welcome the members of the panel. Today we have Alejandro Acosta, who will be moderating this webinar, and Jose Cotua, who will be making the presentation today. And of course, I'd like to, to welcome all the participants and thank them for their joining us today. And those who will be with us today, we will be speaking about IPv6 and last bound and access network before going on. Let me tell you that we have simultaneous interpretation into English and Portuguese, and also simultaneous transcription into English and Portuguese. You will be able to access these resources through the live world icon at the bottom of your screen. Here you can select the language of your preference. Let me briefly tell you how the webinar will take place. I will make a brief presentation. Bien, eh, hemos empezado unos minutos. So, we started a couple of minutes after 1800 UTC. The webinar will last 60 minutes approximately, and the interaction with the panelists will be through the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You will see two chat bubbles there. You can send us your questions, and we suggest to write your questions as we go along or any comments you wish to make in that section. We'll leave some minutes at the end of the presentation for the Q&A session. Alejandro will be reading out the questions submitted by you so that Jose can answer them in the order in which we receive them. Let me also say that this webinar will be recorded and in the next day you will receive the same email to the same email with which you registered in order to be able to have access to the recording and the materials of this webinar. Let me remind you that you can also write to us to training at lacnic.net or also enter the webinar's website at the LACNIC site. To finish and to begin with the presentation of this webinar, we have opened the IPv6 in access networks. For those of you who wish to have more information on this, please write to us. The deadline for the registrations is on March 15th, and the course will begin on March 22nd. And for further information, you can write to us at campus at lacnic.net. So now, that is all I want to tell you. And Alejandro, we can start with the presentation. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Jose. How are you? Good afternoon. First of all, my greetings to everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you at this second webinar organized by LACNIC. The topic we will be seeing today is IPv6 in last mile and access networks by Jose Gregorio Cutua. He's from Venezuela, from the Simon Bolivar University. And he has a lot of experience in the deployment of GPON and IPv6 networks in the entire region. He has worked in almost every country from Mexico down to Argentina. And for me, it's a pleasure to have him with us today. I'd like to ask the participants to ask any questions you might have, as was mentioned. Question. So please don't hesitate to write to us. Happy to answer the questions. So, Jose, you have the floor. Se escucha. Te escucha, muy bien. Eh, Deme un segundito, tengo un detalle con la... Alejandro, te voy a pedir que, que inicie... Ah, vamos a... Deme por favor 30 segundos, que justamente en este momento se me presentó. Si puedes ayudarme Please. con la presentación. Alejandro, can you help me out with the presentation? Because, um... Ayúdame por favor con la presentación. Que 
let, let me see. You can help me with the presentation. We can. All right, here I have it. Okay, se ve? Correcto, ¿verdad? Sí. All right, here we are. So first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in this webinar. I apologize for the slight delay when we kicked off. So I was asked to speak about IPv6 in last mile and access networks. I'm Jose Gregorio Cutua and Alejandro, we can go on to the next slide, please. Si quieres, eh, eh, exacto. Ahora lo voy a, ahora lo voy a compartir. ¿no? I will now share my screen with you. Justamente. Aquí está. Ahí sí. A ver, mira. Muy bien. Ahora sí. Bien. Entonces, a, a hablarles sobre el despliegue. So I'm going to speak about the deployment IPv6 in massive access networks. I like this title, uh, Last Mile and Access Networks. So there are many IP addresses and many, many users. And basically, when we speak about access networks, we are referring to operators' networks. So we're speaking specifically about networks, uh, access networks, and we will be speaking about the access technologies. There are several technologies, but there are three main technologies that we have, which are those based on cable, on copper, and more recently, in the past 10 years, advanced technologies based on fiber, such as GPON. To provide a context of what we are referring to when we speak about a large network for an ISP, there's an important model, which you should always have as a reference, and this is the NGN model. This implies that there are four layers, at least, in any network. You have the access network, the transport network, the control layer, and the application layer. When we speak about access technologies or massive access networks, we're speaking about protocols, technologies, standards, and deployments at the access layer. And they have to deliver things to the users with quality of service and broadband requirements and diversity of service, such as internet, telephony, television, etc. Let us start speaking about the XDSL and DOCSIS technologies to then go over to GPON in the case of XDSL. This is a technology based on the use of copper pairs. And this is a technology that from the standpoint of the architecture has an access unit. This is a DSLAM. And these are the units that go to the subscribers networks. Everything is done in copper, one copper wire for each subscriber. And these are the technologies that in the early 2000s, years of the 21st century, at the end of the 90s, this was a dominating technology. And we had important capacities for bandwidth, but now these capacities are more limited. Now this encapsulation technology is based on the Ethernet transport on an ATM 
infrastructure for the legacy options and for GSL, which directly transport Ethernet over an electric means through a structure of virtual channels known as PVC, which basically is a channel inside another one. The technology XDSL has a number of limitations. Because with distance, we have a great reduction of the capabilities that we can offer, and it is essentially a symmetric technology with some variants of asymmetric. Uh, um, so today it is very limited, but there are still some like that. In the case of DOCSIS, that's a technology that is funded on the use of coaxial cables to, pro, to add it to uh, the uh, users. The architecture is similar. The unit of access is the CMTS, the uh, cable modem uh, system, and it's an active network. It has amplifiers. You have to amplify the signals and work with sequences between 100 and 1,000 megahertz. And it also has its own limitations as it is electrical and it's an active network. These two technologies in the last uh, 20 years have had, and they continue to have, maybe a bit uh, late, but they are still important uh, uh, in the networks. In the case of DOCSIS, it also had, uh, it went from DOCSIS 1.0, now it's 3.1, and uh, in the future we'll have a 4.0, I don't know whether it's not uh, standardized, with a more or less important, and uh, uh, now uh, Dox, in DOCSIS, in uh, the coaxial, there must be a coexistence between 500 to 1,000. Here you see the capability of the access technologies of copper and doxis. And now we will start working of GPON and uh, uh, here I'd like to tell you the differences between this access. Uh, uh, GIPON, uh, XDSL, and DOCSIS. The X is because GPON has several variants and DSL also has several variants. But basically the difference is that GPON is fiber-based and it has a much greater capability than uh, the XDSL and DOCSIS and um, it uh, allows for thousands of users. You can see, for instance, what you can handle in an access, or in a unit of access with XDSL is 3,000, and with GPON, it is easy to find uh, to have up to 32,000 uh, users. Another important characteristic of GPON is the native support of quality of service from the CPU, uh, something that XDSL and uh, and DOCSIS it's it's not uh, uh, it's it's limited. So uh, GPON offers a technology of access of new generation, and that's what we're going to discuss now. Let's now focus on GPON because it's a hot technology at present, and in my view, it's uh, the one that will prevail in the access networks of, of uh, um, massive access to users in five to 20 years time. The access technology for GPON was created in 2003, 2004, when they standardized it uh, commercially and it was available in early 2006 and at the time there was the capability capacity was 2.5 gigabits downstream and 1.25 upstream but it's a technology that starting in 2010 it started to evolve even faster today we have 10 giga gpon and 40 giga GPON or several uh, 10 giga bands. So it has a great capacity and in the last 10 years, and there are no access technology in that, in term, uh, that can beat it in terms uh, of capacity of access. The architecture of a GPON network basically has three big elements. Speaking of the uh, network of access, the first important element is the access unit. If you bear with me, let me reduce the volume. There, the access unit 
that is known as the OLT, the optical line terminator in a, uh, what uh, you used to have in Eastland, and now it's OLT, and this has important switching capabilities and important uh, routing capabilities of control of bandwidth and control of the users and deployment of quality of service, security, uh, traffic control. So it's um, a very strong co coordination of a switch and a route uh, with very significant capacity of controlling all the traffic uh, with the users. Then the CPE units now are the ONT, although there's a variant that is ONU. But uh, the, let's call them ONTs. Those are going to be the CPEs. Initially, the ONTs had switching capacity only, and then they added the routing capacities. So today, really, these ONTs are a router, but the one uh, interface is mounted on GPON, and there it has significant capacity for provisioning of service such as uh, HTTP, proxy DNS, uh, and routing in the case of IPv4, and uh, port routing in the case of IPv6, that's what we are going to discuss right now, a delegation of prefix, prefix delegation, automatic uh, configuration of DHCP, uh, 6.0, road, uh, routement advertisement, etc. So it behaves as home getter, as a router at home. That is the ONT, and in a few minutes, we'll very briefly see how it is configured. So those are the two active structural elements in, that are more important in a GPON. The OLT, uh, the largest, may manage up to 32,000 users with a capacity up to, up to 256 ports, starting with very small OLT of four points, etc. And the third component of the GPON network is the ODN, the optical distribution network. So basically here, the important concept is um, that is the passive optical splitter, so with, that with o, only one fiber, I may handle N number of users. And uh, this is a technology that uses WDM, Mm. Um, because you need in just one fiber you need to to transmit upstream and downstream there you have a four, uh, 14 180 nanometers downstream and 1290 nanometers upstream because there's the only one physical means of the optical panel and i have to optimize the signals the other thing that gpon resolves is the transmission uh, architecture downstream and upstream. And there, Alejandro Cotu once mentioned something very clever. He said, GPON has a structure that is very similar to a satellite transmission because the OLT is the only one that transmits downstream. It's from one to N and, and upstream it, uh, N uh, TPs can, uh, can transmit and only one receive. So it's similar to a satellite. So what GPON does is that upstream, downstream, it uses broadcast traffic um, identification. So they you identify the destination. I'm, this is quite technical, so I won't discuss it. But and upstream, we use an architecture that is known as TDMA, and that structure gives a certain level of quality of service in the slots of time to control the upstream transmission and that is very characteristic of this but only upstream here we have a brief summary of the characteristic gpon characteristics and we are going gpon a traditional gpon has per port 2500 megabits upstream and 1,250 megabits, a bit less, upstream per port. So I can handle that capacity for n number of users connected to that. Each port will handle its own speed. Distances of up to 20 kilometers without any loss of bandwidth assigned. In addition to this, GPON 
You may have heard a very common term, FTPC or EPSA or HR, that uh, refers to the different forms that GPON may use as access uh, for access. The most typical problem that we solve is FTTH that provides a uh, service to home users. GPON network can also give corporate uh, services of carriers such as uh, from cells, uh, 4G, 5G, traffic that comes from uh, um, FTTW. So not only FTTH, but we have a fiber to model to the Wi-Fi wi to core, etc. And it, uh, so GPON is a very broad technology that solves uh, uh, can solve many, many problems, including the uh, uh, transport of the traffic. The other thing is how the services get multiplexed. I'm going to give you just a basic um, concept. GPON uses a structure that is the, it's a gem ports that are the equivalent of the PVCs for the uh, transport of services. And there are some gem ports that are multiple. That's another important characteristic of GPON that uh, it's um, that, well, uh, now uh, OTT is more prevalent, uh, but GPON comes with that native support. So between the OLTs and uh, the ONTs, there are logical channels of service that transport from the ONTs and the OLTs. Later on, we'll see that more in detail. And uh, upstream too. The only thing is that upstream, you have the TDMA that enables you to control the traffic with a certain level of quality of service to assign different uh, bandwidth structures. So here you have a summary of the types of bandwidths that I can use with DBA. I use this to highlight that this is the difference between GPON and XDSL and the DOCSIS. This does not exist in the previous technology. So GPAN, this is very important for GPON. That's something to be highlighted. Here you have a summary of the most important characteristics. So we're going to mention one or two physical multiplexion in each port, PON port. Thanks to the use of the splitter, I can have 16, 32 clients, 64 clients, and even up to 128 clients. Of course, with some implications as to distance and the way the signal is treated. 2.5 giga and 1.25 gigas, there's a symmetric variant, 2.5 and 1.5, uh, but for some uh, special uh, uh, cards, distances of up to 20 kilometers, and with some adjustments, I can even reach 40 to 80 kilometers, different architectures, and another important aspect, and with this, I close the theory of uh, GPON, and it is that with GPON, we think of the so-called zero touch provisioning with TR-069 and ACS. The idea is that as, as an access network, the operator does not have to touch the uh, CPE. There should be a system that we haven't discussed today, but there's a system that is in charge without touching the CPE and is to provide it automatically. That's very interesting. GPON has it and not the other technologies. So there I leave some additional characteristics that are to be highlighted. Now let's discuss, I'm, I'm going to give you, to show you a brief demo. And it, it has to do with the way we handle the structure of service. The first thing we need to say about GPON is that in the ONT, it is absolutely, it's not configured. We have to configure the way we want it to work. If we want it to, to work as switching or as a router or a switching uh, switcher in some ports and router in other ports. So it is absolutely flexible the way you configure the CPE. Of course, there are some configurations that are quite typical. Here is one of them. There are many, many, but I'm going to mention two, two or three. In this case, and to mention the most important aspects, 
the structure that enables the transport of this to the users has a TDMA structure, which is upstream. Now, the important thing here is to understand that the services are transmitted upstream and downstream through a logical channel, which is called GEMPOD. When you start working with GPON, or if you're already working with GPON, this is the first thing that you will understand, the GEMPOD. What I have to do then is to connect services and to and from here. So I'm connecting service threads to the gem port. So the traffic comes from the subscriber. It goes through here to the ONT and to the gem port, to the F port. So I can associate a gem port to different ports, to one port, to several ports, to a VLAN, and on that VLAN with a switching structure, I can provide transit to several ports using the switching concept so this is the native and original concept of GPON. Now, the more modern concept is at the ONT level. I have a routing infrastructure. And here we have IPv6, which plays an important role. The CPE will start to do routing of the traffic in IPv6. One, one side, a LAN side, the client connects to one of the ports. The internal router of the CPE does the provisioning. It does the routing. And then there's an important thing that happens with IPv6, but we don't have an IPv4. And this is the IP addresses for the LAN side of the router that you have on the CP in the IPv4. These are private addresses. But in the case of IPv6, you're aware that the concept of NAT does not exist, or at least it's not deployed. So the idea is that in IPv6, the client has the global IP. And then this is the initial we have to figure out a solution for. And I will explain this. I will show you how I signed the LAN network of the client. So the point is that now in GPON, the CPE has a router. And the only different thing compared to other things, it's not a physical interface, it's a logical interface connected to a gem port to the VLAN and is transported by the GPON structure, both upstream and downstream. This is the new part now from the standpoint of the service. It's not all too different from a router that has a one and a LAN interface and that will have other things. Now, this is a combination. I can have a CP with one router and a transport structure at the lay level of layer two purely, and I can do different service combinations. Going a couple of steps forward, another important thing is that the ONT, and this brought in a GPON, the ONT allows me to deploy in the same CP, not only the internet service, but also the PTB service and telephony service, with an IP phone, analog, through a media way, gateway. So I can construct this through a profile-based structure. I can have the triple play and provide channels for layer two and layer three transport for managing things such as provisioning and so on. Now, looking at a uh, higher structure, because so far we saw how the ONT works. Now, if we do a zoom out, we have to see how the continuity service is with the ONT. So the ONT service goes through the ONT, it is routed after it's provisioned, it's transported in a gem port, it goes through the optic line to the OLT, the OLT does the switching, and the OLT can also work in layer two and in layer three. But in the majority of the cases, the OLT, and this is typical for many of deployments using layer two, see so the OL2 from the standpoint of the service is a switch. It's a switch with a large capacity with advanced treatments of the service threads 
you also have advanced services for VLAN switching and brand width control and MAC address control and broadcast and multicast and so on. So this is an advanced switching option. So traffic is commuted and then delivered. So this is the concept of GPON. This is how services are provided with GPON. Now let us see, we'll make a demo of how this should be configured. The first thing with GPON is that I have to configure the ONT and the OLT. In order to configure the ONT, there are several mechanisms. There is a web interface. I can do this through a provisioning server automatically, or also through the OLT with commands. This is something that the CPEs did not have in the past with other technologies. So the important thing here is to see the continuity of service, how the service flows. And in the minutes I have left, I will focus on those who have internet service. We have, would have to see how this works with subscriber, television, and telephony, and transport services, and so on. Chipon is a technology that allows for that. But I want to speak about internet services today. So basically, it's as follows. There are several variants, but one of the variants is as follows. The client delivers traffic to the OLT traffic. Looking this upstream, the same happens downstream uh, analogically. So the client delivers this to a laptop or smartphone via Wi-Fi. They connect to the ONT port. They also have Wi-Fi ports. And that is delivered to an internal router in the CPE. This router then has the traffic routing. I'm speaking about IPv6 traffic. This traffic is routed to an access router at, in front of the OLT. This is a switch. So the link draw is this router we have here. That traffic and here is where GPON comes in, is mounted on a VLAN, and from the VLAN, it goes to the logical channel, which is called the GEM port. It's transported through the GPON line. It reaches the OLT. The OLT takes it out of the GPON and switches it to layer two, going from one VLAN to another. So this is quite typical in terms of the access technology. And then traffic is switched to a port called the uplink port, where the service is then delivered to the higher level uh, router. So what GPON does is the following. It takes a service of this router. It transports this. GPON is the transport technology in layer two for to access, have access. It takes this Ethernet traffic, it is transported to a logical channel, it is delivered to the OLT, it is switched once again by the OLT and delivers it to the uplink port. It used to be one gig and now it's 10 giga until it reaches the access router, which can be a micro chip or whatever. And this is where the provisioning takes place which is DHCP or prefix delegation and so on. So this is the basic structure of how I provide a service on GPON. Now let's look at the demo. This is the same graph, but addressed at GPON. This is the OLT. This is the different ONTs. Here we provide the service. And here we have the router, it is commuted, it can be directly connected to a router, or also through a switch. So now the important thing here is the following, and this is the key point. The router in the OLT has to have IPv6 addressing at the level of the WAN interface and at the level of the WAN interface. At the WAN interface level, there are several 
options, at least two schemes, or three rather. One is DHCP addressing, one is with Slack addressing. Or The one that is used most for practical reason is RNA. So the access router we have here has to provide the RA. We have to have the RA here, so it provides addressing to the one interface of the CPU. This is addressing that has a link local associated to it. So the other point is that I have to provide addressing to the plan on this side. That addressing also has several options. And this can also come through DHCP too. But the one that is most used is with a protocol. And if you're going to use massive access networks, you should bear this in mind and study it. And this is the DHCP V6 with prefix delegation. The idea is that we should have a DHCP server that not only delivers IP addresses, but the most important thing is that it also delivers prefixes. Prefix have to be delivered so that they are configured in the one side. In this case, in this demo, we took a micro tick router and here we configured an RA so that the VLAN it can announce a prefix for the, the CPEs in that VLAN with an RA64. And for practical reason in a GPON network we don't have more than one thousand subscriber and there we mount the this. Now, let me explain how this is done. This shows in further detail. Here we have the delegator, the RA, and all this happens transparently here until we reach this router. This router receives RA, which is a VLAN 300, and it is switched here to this VLAN. This is a VLAN 425. Now, let's see how this happened. And I'm going to show you the technical details here. Now I will go directly to configuration of the micro tick. I selected micro tick, but this same process, the same procedure should be applied whichever the router that has DHCP support or RA support. In the case of micro tick, the IPv6, this has to be activated. The IPv6 packet has to be activated. We have to say not to accept the RA because it's a router. I have to create the VLAN in the interfaces and an important aspect. Everything is worked at on the VLAN. I create the VLAN. I assign the address to the VLAN. I take one IP from the slash 264 prefix. I tell it to do the RA equals yes. And very important. I have to do the tuning of the RA. When you do RA on a VLAN, you have to define the interval in which this is sent, the lifetime. I work with 20 minutes personally. And it's also send the MAC address to do the neighbor resolution and the CPE can be routed. And then to send the DNS is, you can now send the DNS in the most recent versions. Now, where are the DNSs that are sent? These are in the IPv6 menu, menu. the DNSs that are advised to the RA are in the menu, the DNS menu of IPv4. And basically I can configure them here. I use the ones of Google, but the idea is to use the IP ones. Now, what I'm going to do now is to set up the prefix locator. 
the PHPE can also send DNSs. In the case of MicroTrick, there is a detail regarding the DNS as a delegator. It has to be written in hexadecimal, so you have the command. And I can also send other parameters such as the domain, the NTP, and so on. On the delegator, there's a whole discussion and many opinions out there as to the type kinds of prefix assigned to the end user. I personally think that this has to be assigned according to LACNIC's uh, references. There are several options, 36 to 48, 40 to 48. Here you have a table for the number of prefixes that can be assigned. Now, in this case, this was done with 36 to uh, slash 48. This is a DHCP, and then the configuration of the OLT. I will stop here a while because I want to show you the following. This is a micro tick, and here you have the DNS thing in the IPv4 menu. And I have to create the pool for IPv6 that I'm going to delegate the prefix 36. And this is the prefix I can delegate. I mount this. I take one of these addresses. I activate the RA, and most importantly, I have to include this here with the times and so on. It, and finally, I mount the DHCP CD server that is mounted here. Here is the delegator. And here, I say in which VLAN to deliver and the route that they're going to use. And here, another important thing that has to do with the routing, I'm going to repeat it more slowly because this is very important, it's the routing of the delegated prefix. In the case of MicroTik, the, the good thing is that whenever uh, MicroTik uh, delivers, uh, it gives the routing. It's good because in the past you had to do it with another route. So with this, basically, MicroTik is ready. And then I just have a few minutes late, so uh, a few minutes left. So I'm going to go a bit faster. But three comments before I show the results. And it is that in the OLTs, they have to also configure IPv6. There are many things to configure because the OLT is uh, another equipment and et cetera, the syslog and, uh, and then we have to configure the service. Uh, an important thing about OLT is that IPv6 comes very raw. You have to build it from scratch. And in each interface, you have to enable it and to create uh, the local address and uh, you have to put IP. And in the OLTs, in this case, the Huawei, we can put IPv6 to a VLAN service, uh, um, an interface of management, etc. Well, so we create the service VLANs. In this case, it's 425, and I also created 430 for management. We associate the ports with a structure known as port VLAN. This is the addressing of the V line of service. We don't need it for IPv6 for the services to go through GPON, but you do need them for management purposes, for CCLH, for validation purposes, etc. But as the OLT works on layer two, you don't need addressing, but I recommend it to use it to connect to CCH and everything that can be done with IPv6, I recommend to do it and that should be part of the transition. This part is the traffic profiles for the bandwidths. We create the uh, uh, transport uh, 
the uh, an important characteristic of GPON is that encrypts the traffic in the optic uh, uh, fiber and you conclude the configurations so you add the OLT and you create the service with a structure that is called service for let's see the results I'm connected here here I'm connected to an ONT that is remote Let's, let me try again a couple of times. Well, the connection crashed in the PC that is behind, but that's okay. I can show you the result of the connection in the MyCritic. There it comes, there, it's coming. I have an engineer there that's doing things. So this is, let me, I have just five minutes late. Do I have five minutes? Five minutes, and then we have quite a few questions. Yes, we will try to cover them all. Five minutes to show you the result. This is the ONT. I'm configuring it, the web interface. Today, this is done with automatic uh, provisioning, but I'm going to show you the configuration. I want to show you the concept. This is the so-called router that I called. It's created in VLAN 300, and then the, the OLT commutes to 425, and this is important. The CPE may be provisioned with an IP over E or with CP over E. And here I'm going to do it in the Ethernet. That router may be dual stack IPv4 only or IPv6 only, and it would be interesting to manage some clients with IPv6 uh, uh, only because uh, almost everybody is in IPv6, uh, or Netflix, YouTube, they're all in IPv6. I enable VLAN and I associate the ports that I wanted to give service to. And here I have the important thing of IPv6. First, to say how they, it's going to acquire the prefix. A key aspect of IPv6 in GPON and in any access technology is how do I deliver the prefix to the CPE? That's the core of the whole thing, to handle these uh, uh, networks with uh, uh, many users. And so in this case, the ONT asks me, how do you want me to obtain the prefixes? So I tell them, obtain them through DHCP6. And then how do I get the IP of the one? This is plan. And automatically, it starts working. What's the result of this? that when we see the ONT, transact, uh, it had a transaction, and look at this, how interesting. This is the prefix that the delegator gave. In this case, it's a slash 48. So I'm using the prefixes of the Statlink of Mexico that very kindly lent us the ONT and the ONT for these tests. In this case, the delegator gave a, a prefix. There you have it, 2806, et cetera. 48 and then on the other hand it obtained an IP this is the IP that was obtained through RA that that is this is the prefix slash 64 that sent the RA to Microtech and generated this and there you have it so what happens it, at the level of LAN this ONT will take this prefix there are 65,000 pre slash 48 prefixes this is an issue that is discussed but it's uh, yeah, we understand it now the important thing is that the ont will pick one of those prefixes one of those prefixes to configure the lan interface in the ipv6 and the important thing there is that we can tell the ont the prefix I wanted to get uh, to obtain, and that is done through the so-called uh, prefix mask. And this is an interesting one because I don't tell anything. That, then he will pick any prefix of the sixty-five thousand that he picked. In this case, I, I mask it, and I can direct it and say, 
use prefix 0033 that you obtained from the process in the one. Another important aspect of that is the OLT in the one side. You don't put a, a one IP because the idea is that here you configure it and it says, how do I handle the reserve of resources for the NAN network? So I, I raise the flag, the lift flags and the DHCP and I tell him to get the DNSs that I got from the RA. It seems a bit complex, but once you digest it, it's quite easy. What's the result of this? That the PC that is, or the device that is connected behind that ONT obtains the uh, directions here, uh, the uh, addressing. This is the delegate prefix here. Dot 33 with the prefix mask, then put the uh, IP. It also handles the temporal addresses. This is the default gateway that is the link local address of, and here the DNS. And the result is that the PC already has IPv6. I'm pinning the uh, Google. And here I have the IPv6 test. IPv6.com, there I have IPv6. This is the address of the PC. Here I have a test with Google. Here I have interesting addresses with which you can test. It's the uh, test IPv6, uh, IPv6 test Google, and there is a word is my IPv6 that tells me what is here. They give you the address in IPv6, and there I can download. Now I'm going to download it just for the purpose of seeing the bandwidth. And finally, here I have a YouTube and a tool that I really recommend that is IPvFO. Oh, oh, that tells you whether you're connected to IPv6 or IPv4. Here it tells me that I'm connected to IPv6 uh, YouTube. And here I see, I want to can see the IPv6 uh, YouTube with IPv6 because it says up there. And I can see the consumption of, uh, I, of the bandwidth. It's VLAN 425. Here I have 173 megas, 288 megas. And this is the PC that is downloading the images and is uh, looking at YouTube also in IPv6. Basically, that is the result. The idea is that notice that basically everything is governed by the router of access, the microtech uh, the micro that delivers the prefixes via DHCP and, and the DNSs, IPv6, and routes the delegated prefixes. And GPON served as transport for the traffic to reach the CPE, and then the CPE receives that information and translates it and uh, delivers it in the LAN side in the CPE. A last comment. The CPE may do more things in IPv6 it can proxy the DNS traffic from, uh, it may have transition mechanisms as DS slide, and uh, we are waiting for, for, for the, uh, sub, the um, uh, vendors to put others so, so uh, we can uh, have either, um, and with, we can have a NAT64. All the transition uh, translation mechanisms are can be applied even simultaneously. Provisionally, the access router, the CPE, and the OLT and GPON, that they are transport means of Ethernet traffic and therefore IPv6 traffic between the CPE and the access router. Basically, that is what I had to tell you. There's a lot more information, but uh, for the sake of time, I think that we can stop here and uh, you may have a, an, uh, an important thing. 
Thank you for listening. I have questions for the details. So I'm open to any questions that uh, you may have. Alejandro? Oh, sorry. Yes? Oh, of course, I want to thank the attendees, Central Acnic and uh, Settling of Mexico, who provided the OLTs and ONTs and gave us all the local support, especially Rafael Nunez, Vice President of Satling. And now, Alejandro. Thank you, Jose. Thank you for your excellent presentation. And also, I know that in Japan there's a lot of information and covering it all in just uh, barely 45 minutes is really impossible. But Jose, there are many questions in the Q&A uh, section. So please try to answer them very briefly, maybe 30 seconds per question, or 45. The first one comes from an anonymous attendee. It says, how can you broaden, widen a GPON network if they are built or designed for a specific number of postal users? Well, defining the size of the number of uh, users that I can, that can wear g -pon depends on two variables. The number of pawn, uh, um, ports that I have in the unit, and the other one has to do with uh, well, the Peter levels from 64 with, with, with a split. For instance, 60, you can have 64, the first level, uh, 1 to 64, and the one went from 1 to 68. And if you provision, for, for instance, 132, and then you run short with that, uh, with the users, you have two choices. Either you add more, more ports to the OLT, either by adding new cards or new OLTs, or you change the splitter levels, for instance, if in the first uh, splitter level you had two more to eight, you put one, two, one, right, 16. So from then on, you have to put more fiber, more uh, distribution cable, etc. But that's the only way out. Either you put more pump uh, uh, ports or more splitters. The, those are two ways. If you want to. Uh, add more users per port. Yes, that's what he meant. Try to be briefer with your answers in the next one because of the time we have. Another anonymous participant, when you say that an OLT is a router, you see that at my home, I don't need to have a router. All right, the GPO network has two active elements, the CPE in the subscriber's home and the OLT, which is at the border of the operator. The both can act in layer two and in layer three. So you have four possible combinations, layer two, layer two, layer two, layer three, layer three, layer two, and layer three, layer three. The most used option is that the CPE is level three and the OLT is level two. If it's layer Sorry, too. If the OT is layer three, this depends on your CP. If your CP is layer two, you don't need to have the router in the CPE and in the subscriber's home. But it has a disadvantage as everything goes against the OLT. The OT has a lot of multicast and broadcast and so on and this is no use no longer used practically okay, the second scenario is the OLT is layer three and the CPE is layer three and the OLT does relay of the DHCPs or does routing uh, uh, smart uh, uh, routing of the traffic from the CPE. Jose, another question from Eliana Alarcón. The question is, if for IPv4 you use the PPOE protocol and AAA radius, the IP assignment is done dynamically through a BRES. Which are the best practices for deploying IPv6 in massive 
users? In other words, is it convenient to do this dynamically or should you assign a range for each client and what masks should be assigned to each client? Well, that question has several things to consider. Provisioning, it is quite true. Provisioning is how the one is, receives the IPs and how do prefix delegation can be done with DHCPP or with PPOE. Now, the DHCP, the point of the DHCP is when you have IPv6 and IPv4, we go along different paths. So these can be even in different devices. So when you have IPv6 and you're going to use PPOE, this takes you both to IPv4 and IPv6. And that is the advantage of the PPOE in one single process, in one single device, it's just a delegation and then there is the HTTP before and the prefixes and the same PPOE. So the CPA picks up one session and does everything to PPOE. If I'm asked about this, I prefer the DHCP because PPPOE has a lot of features of synchronism and there might be disconnections and you have disconnections of the PPPOE and this is something that you have to deal with. And with the DHCP, both in IPv6 and in IPv4, these are asynchronic protocols. So in that case, you don't have to deal with those issues, and there's no problem but to solve the issues of prefix delivery through delegation. Okay, Jose, eh, mil gracias por eso. Thank you, Jose. A couple of more questions, even briefer. Thank you anyway, because the idea is to answer the questions properly. Claudia Lorena. Ask, if I have a network that is not G1 and I have a useful equipment, how can I go out to the internet with an IPv6 prefix without using NPT protocol? NPT network prefix translation and at. Well, if you don't have G1 and if you have a prefix, the first thing is that that prefix has to be announced. That's the first point. In IPv6, prefixes have to be routed in the internet so that your prefix is known by the entire network and you can be reached and you can reach internet. If between the border that announces that prefix through an internal network there's a translate, translation, then you can define this depending on whether the prefixes are moved and if you want them to maintain them, then you use the NPT, but the, basically the prefixes are announced and you have to define which is your strategy for assigning the prefixes internally. And regarding the length assigned to the subscriber between 48 and 60, I tend to prefer slash 48, but otherwise you have a slash 56. I want to go lower than that, not so fast. Excellent. And that supports a question I have here. Too. A question asked by Rodrigo Jaramillo. How has been the transition in your experience? IPv4 to CGNAT, to IPv6, or dual stack in the ONTs? Dual stack. The cases I have handled in different countries, thanks to the operators that have decided to count on our work to collaborate with them, we have seen better results with dual stack. In other words, when we cannot deploy IPv6 only for end clients or for 64 x lat so that's IPv6 only, and then we can go over to those that have IPv4, and then dual stack moves the IPv6 traffic. I have a lot of experience where initially the IPv6 traffic was one to 2%, and then you see that over the months, in a short period of time, this has evolved and have more than 50% of the traffic in IPv6. I have a giga with IPv4 and 500 mega with IPv6. And why? Because the social media all are based on IPv6. Gaming is on IPv6. For the client, this is transparent. The client opens YouTube, and when you see the news dual stack, then they're going to opt for go over to IPv6 and 
of that too. So Jill's back has enabled that the teaching that begins to sort of relax. Jill's back will incline things towards IPv6. That's my experience, at least in, in Latin America. Great, of course, thanks for that point. So three more questions. A question from A. Burgos. Communication between the one of the ONT and the provider, service provider one can be done through link local or um, I didn't comment on this directly. The one interface of the CPE does not need want to do traffic routing of the client. We want to provide traffic to the client. So in that sense, we don't need one. We know that the neighbor discovery resolves a link local routing. I didn't show this to you, but if you look at the link between the one and the OLT, so that you don't the or so, so you can do ping, you can see, and for that you would need the one in the ONT, and it can be visible from outside. But traffic, the link local, is perfectly routed. So the client's traffic comes, and the one comes, and it is routed, and it enters the CPE and the access router at the link local level. This is a good exercise. You'll see that uh, you have internet in the client. I hope that uh, I responded well, because the, the question is very important, and so is the answer. Sometimes there are a lot of doubts about that. Yes, of course. Thank you. Very good answer. We have another question, and this would it would be the one before last. Juan Carlos says, good afternoon. Are there any technologies in the GPON technology that enables you to have backup connection or redundancy at the level of the final e, uh, uh, users very good questions my congratulations to the audience these are very interesting questions each of one uh, each one of these questions could be the amount of a topic for um, a web uh, a webinar so we we always have redundancy mm -hmm. I may have redundancy, for instance, in the, as a matter of fact, there are splitters from two to one. I can have redundancy of a fiber that goes from the OLT to the splitter or the other way around, from the, the last splitter to the user cable drop, or you may have a ONT with two uh, GPON ports, so you may have an uh, analog, uh, analog uh, channel with redundancy. So there are structures that enable you to have a backup of the GPON network as such. What happens, as, as always, um, that is, um, uh, there's, a, there's always a compromise, and that is that these structures are not very uh, commonly used because it has an impact in the cost for the end user. Because if you are going to have redundancy from the last splitter to the user, you need two cables. If you're going to have that, and then the ONT needs to have two ports, and then it's no longer $20, but $35, for instance. So, but there are structures for backup with fiber at the level of the, uh, uh, even in the OLT, because you can uh, uh, do the backup of one port with another. So you may have an OLT as backup, and the same uh, user may receive an active GPON port and a backup uh, GPON port uh, in another. So both the support, uh, the the all uh, the everything is uh, redundable. The only thing is cost. Jose, thank you for that very precise answer. And the last question that uh, the audience would have is as follows. It's also an anonymous uh, participant. It says, good afternoon. Do you have any tips for placing splitters in the first level of a GPON network? Well, the, the tip, I'm going to give the tips uh, thinking of the future, looking 
for the future because in 2018 or 19, I think it was in 2018 that they, that one of these organizations, I don't remember exactly who, it was the year of entry into the gigabit era. In Singapore, there's a plan of asymmetrical gigabits. You may have a gigabit at home. In Argentina, there are also gigabit plans. In Peru, here in Chile, there are 500 megabit uh, plans. So we now uh, we entered the era of uh, the big uh, bandwidth. And now, so what happens? It's very likely that in the next uh, eight years, for instance, if you are an ISP that sells small plans, 20 megas, very soon you'll sell uh, 100, 200, 500, 1 giga. So my recommendation is that you shouldn't go any further of a splitting of 132, because if you have to sell a, a lot of bandwidth, you it, you won't be able to do it with more than uh, 132. Already with 32 ports, more than 32 users and one only and only one port, you can't unleash. And uh, even if uh, the users pay cheap, but one 132, the more than you can have, if that where my the recommendation. My recommendation would be one two in the first level of splitter and one in 16 in the second level of splitter or 132 in an ant box of one. Now, if you say, no, I want to continue with the one in 64, one, uh, 128 to less little, um, uh, 10, 20 megas per user, not more than that, then you might have the, the, scheme, the most popular schemes are one, in four in the first splitter and one in 16 in the second splitter that is the most used and the second most use is one in eight and one to 16 but then there are other schemes such as one to eight and one one to eight one to 16 and the like what is true not more than two levels of splitter and i repeat that even in the next 10 years, I recommend, this is my personal view, don't think of more than 132 and if possible, when you go to 132, you have to invest a bit more in fiber because you have to put more fibers. And if it's possible, one to next 16, because after two or three years and you want to sell plans with uh, 500 megas or even corporate plans, you're going to be ready for that level. So that's what most people are doing on any of those three variants that I just told you. I hope that I answered what the gentleman asked. Thank you, Jose. Well, thank you for your answers and your time collab and for collaborating with LACNIC, being a, the instructor in this webinar. And having said that, I want to thank everyone. And now I'm going to give the floor to Sandra to wrap up. Sandra. Muchas gracias, Alejandro. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Jose. This was an excellent activity. To tell you the truth, I'm very grateful for all your contributions and for sharing your knowledge with the community. I also want to thank all those of you who joined us in this webinar. And we invite you to visit the uh, website of LACNIC and uh, to pay close attention to the social media where we'll let you know about what's happening in training. Remember that uh, the registrations are open for the IPv6 course with uh, um, last uh, mile uh, users. Well, thank you and uh, see you in the future. Good afternoon. Goodbye.